Hey friends, we're so happy to be back together in here tonight. Can you believe that the last time that we gathered like this was two years ago? And in our wildest dreams, I don't know that we could have predicted the things that we've experienced over these last two years, not only at the national and global levels, but the private battles that many of us and our loved ones have faced in our everyday lives. And although things still aren't quite back to the way that we want and wish they could be tonight, we'll take whatever we can for a chance to be together and connect in spiritual camaraderie with our community of kind women. A lot has changed for all of us, but one thing that hasn't changed is the power of kindness and our commitment to encourage you to be women who live kindly. And these past few years, they've really put us to the test on this on the daily, haven't they? But here's the thing, kindness may be trendy in this world, but real kindness actually changes lives. Real kindness is not found in courtesy, but it's rooted in character. Real kindness is not a response to what other people do to us. It's about what Jesus has done for us. This world doesn't need more nice people. The world needs more people who know and love Jesus and experience His kindness through us. So hopefully tonight you will laugh and you'll connect with friends and you'll have fun. And all of those are really good and important things. But tonight is also about taking what you hear with you when you leave and living it out in the world around you so that the people in your life not only see Jesus in you, but they want to experience Him in their own lives for themselves. So that being said, let's enjoy this night together and then go out and be the kindness that we each want and the kindness that we all need in the world. I love you and I'm so grateful to be a part of a community of women who have a heart to cultivate kindness. Now we get to do one of the absolute best parts of every gathering we have. Let's worship. Ladies of Cultivate, would you stand with us? We're gonna put our hands together. We're gonna worship God today.
king that we just sang about is the same exact king who is here. He's here to meet with you. So let's not miss him. Let's just acknowledge his presence by giving him all the glory that he deserves and all the praise that he can give.
in the name of Jesus and only in the name of Jesus alone. There is freedom while you wait for the diagnosis. There is freedom in your grief. There is freedom from your depression and there is freedom from your anxiety and there is freedom while you labor in prayer over your loved one. There is freedom in that place. Even in the middle of that. Even in the middle of that. The Bible says that since we have been made right in God's sight by our faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand and confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. And we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials for we know that they help us develop endurance and endurance develops strength of character and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation and this hope will not lead to disappointment for we know how dearly, how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. We know how dearly he loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to comfort, to bring peace, to bring calm in the chaos. The Bible also says that the Holy Spirit has always existed, even before the world as we know it was created. The Holy Spirit hovered over what the Bible says was just the deep. The Spirit of God has always existed. The Spirit of God exists now in this place. Just as the Spirit of God was present then, the Spirit of God is present now and forever will be. And so as we sing this song, what we're simply gonna be asking for is just as the Spirit was moving over the waters, over the deep, Spirit of God, would you come and would you rest on us?
There's nothing like the peace that we find in your presence, Jesus. There's no other place to be. There's no other task. There's no agenda. It is good enough to just be still. just the sound of our voices tonight, but the posture of our hearts be pleasing to you tonight, oh God. You set aside every distraction because there's nothing better to look at than you. We pause every thought because there's nothing better to think about than you. merciful to grace us with your presence yet again. Every morning your mercies are new. Every morning you show yourself faithful to us again.
Thank you for singing with us. You may now go ahead and take your seat. There was a day I was not feeling good and I mentioned to my neighbor that I really wanted ice cream and she brought me five pints of Talenti ice cream. I was having a hard time asking for help and then a friend texted and said, what time can I be there? I was having a really bad day, but my friend included me and I felt wanted and not alone. My mom passed away recently and my community came and rallied around me. They brought me flowers, they brought me meals, they brought me snacks I love. I just was flooded with kindness in a time of sadness. I was having a hard time and my whole community group came together, got me a gift and prayed over me and that made me feel very thought of and loved. People brought us dinner for our family after we had our twin babies and it really reminded me of how loved we are by our community. A lady at church surprised me one time by having everyone bring flowers to me on Sunday morning and giving them to me as they entered the auditorium and it just blessed me so much. I was really sick earlier this year and I just had a wonderful friend come to my house, bring me meals and feed my family and I'm just so thankful for her. Wow. Uh, Tammy and I were just sitting up here and we were just thinking about how two years ago we were in this room and we were all about 2020. We were like, come at me 2020, new decade 2020. You know what happened three months into it? We were like, I want my money back on 2020. I'll take 2019. Actually, take me back to seventh grade where I have braces and pimples. Give me back, I'll take anything other than 2020, right? Guys, life got so weird, didn't it? Did it get weird for anybody else or was it just me? It got weird. I remember so distinctly um, in March of 2020 when all this stuff started unraveling and I'm sitting in my room and I don't know if you remember, but it was like apocalyptic type weather. It was like rainy, which feels apocalyptic in Southern California. And it was cold, like legitimately cold, you guys, like 50s cold. <laughs> and it was like, stay home, don't go out, get all the food you can get. I was buying dog food and feeding it to my kids. I didn't know, it was just. <laughs> and I was sitting in my room one day and I was just like, what's happening? What, what are we gonna do? And my husband walked into the room. My husband is um, a high five on the Enneagram. So this whole idea of staying home forever sounded amazing to him. <laughs> he was like, babe, this is gonna be awesome. The kids are getting so big. We always talk about slowing down. And we'll just get to be here together and I'll make us some food. And listen, y'all need to marry a man who can make you some food, okay? I was, I was like, you know what? Now I'm not feeling so bad. <laughs> he, he was like, and it's gonna be great. We're gonna have all this together time. I was like, you know what? You're right. Man, God, ch change my attitude to one of gratitude. And for two hours, I gave it my best shot, you guys. <laughs> but about two hours later, I was walking towards the front door. He's like, where are you going? I was like, out. He's like, nothing's open. I'm like, I gotta go. I don't know. I just, I gotta go. I can't. It felt like weird, crazy weird. But can I just tell you something? We're here tonight and God is good. <laughs> And if there's one thing we've learned, if there's one thing we've learned, it's this. It's that life is gonna throw everything it has at us. And we are not in charge of this life. But this life is all we got. And so tonight, I really believe that there are two questions. There's two questions, I believe, that regardless of what your life looks like, regardless of what it has looked like, regardless of what you want it to look like going forward, if you will say, I will have the courage to ask these two questions and not just ask them. I will have the courage to answer them and to do the work required once I answer them. I believe it can change your life. And I believe that because it's changing mine. I wanna pray for us real quick before we jump in. God, would you give us courage? Would you make us brave? Would you make us honest tonight and authentic? Would you teach us what it means to be real? 
God, I don't know what you wanna do in and through the women in this room, but I know you wanna do something. So God, may we lean in and listen because you are speaking. And as we sang earlier, all we want is you. We just want you. So help us, God, to listen and to lean in and to do the work. It's in your name we pray, amen. So if you take notes, if you don't, you should, I think, because I'm over 40 now, so I don't remember anything. So if you are taking notes, here's question number one. What am I learning about myself? What am I learning about myself? The idea of learning means studying. Do you study yourself? When we learn about ourselves, when we study ourselves and we see things in ourselves that we maybe say, I don't think that that's right. Maybe, that's, maybe there's something that I need to change. But let me ask you, what are you like when you're stressed? What are you like when you're irritated? What are you like when you're disappointed? Do you monitor the thoughts that you think? Do you understand your emotions? Do you know why you do the things you do when you feel the way that you feel and you think the way that you think? What are you learning about yourself? How many of you were part of the U series that we did at Sandals Church this past fall? Let me see here, yes, awesome. Um, I and my core style is um, eight, I'm an Enneagram eight, and we are the quiet peacemakers on the Enneagram. <laughs> That hurt my feelings, you guys. <laughs> Actually, what's funny is the nines are out there like, yeah, sure, you can be a nine, whatever, we're peaceful, be whatever you want. <laughs> no, I'm an eight, I, I, my core style is an eight, and we're known to be a bit aggressive at times. Any other eights in the room, right? <laughs> See, they're like, yeah, we're here, yeah, what's up, right? We tend to be aggressive. We can be, we are, we're called the challengers. Um, a lot of us are, are good leaders or have leadership skills. And sometimes those are really good things. And other times I've learned from other people telling me that they're not so good. So a few weeks ago was my husband's birthday and we made a reservation at a really nice restaurant to celebrate him. And the restaurant was incredibly busy. So when we got there, it felt so good to walk up and just say, we have a reservation. He says, oh, Miss Workman, I'll get your table ready just one minute. I said, you know what, babe, I'm gonna go use the women's room so that we can just enjoy um, the meal. Cause again, over 40, go to the bathroom when you can. So I just said, I'm gonna go now and, and I, but, what, that way we can just relax. So um, again, reservation, no need to rush, my table's there. And I get into the bathroom and there's a line. So I get in line. And I waited for about three seconds and this is what happens inside my head. I look at the lady who's in the front of the line. By the way, I name strangers. If I don't know you, I'll tell you what your name is after the show, okay? And I said, am I just supposed to stand in line and trust that Barb has looked under all the stalls to make sure they're all empty? Cause I'm looking at Barb and I don't know if she did the work. <laughs> I look at lady number two, Jean. Jean was just there. I don't think Jean, maybe hopefully she knew she was in the women's room. I'm not sure. So I'm number three. So I have a decision to make at this point. Do I just let Barb lead us? <laughs> or do I take over? And so you guys, I did one of these. Uh, no, no, okay, Barb, stall number two is open. Jean, stall number three, let's move the whole show along. <laughs> Getting it done. I walk out, I say to my husband, geez, I had to be in charge in there. He's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I tell him the whole story. He's like, you know, you could have just stood there. I'm like, that is unacceptable. <laughs> I'm learning about myself that I might be a little bit impatient, <laughs> that I might not wanna stand in line and I don't give great names to strangers. That's another thing I'm learning about myself. But here's the thing, as I have begun to learn about myself, really learn about myself and discover things about myself that I say, you know what, I need to grow here. I need to change. It takes work, it takes effort. It's gonna take work and it's gonna take effort for you to learn about yourself. But here's the thing for all of us tonight, we have an enemy against us learning about ourselves. And it's the same enemy for every single one of us. It doesn't matter if you're 13 or 30, 70, 73, it doesn't matter. Same 
enemy against you and against me learning about ourselves. And here's our enemy, it's distraction. What keeps you distracted? There's something keeping you from paying attention and focusing on learning about yourself. Here is the definition of distraction. It's a thing that prevents someone from giving full attention to something else. It's something that's keeping you from giving your full attention to something else. So in this case, the something else is learning about you. Who is the real you? Listen, your relationships will only be as deep as you are. And depth requires digging. So are you willing to do the work to go deep, to dig into the roots and the soil of your heart and discover who you really are? Or does distraction get the last word? Regardless of what it is that keeps you distracted, for a lot of us, it's that nifty little thing that we always have with us that's so helpful. Do you know why it's so helpful? Because it tells me what's going on with everybody else. I'm so glad someone invented that. <laughs> I can just know what Jennifer Aniston, where she lost her dog yesterday, and that's helpful to me. <laughs> and we just, we just go, we just, oh, did you know? Did you know? Oh, she did not. Of course she did. She always does. <laughs> Listen, I have to tell you something. Here, here's where we're at sometimes. Me, you, I'd rather scroll through your life than examine my own. I'd rather see what you had to eat and what, what you did to your tree and where you went on vacation, why? So I can talk about you behind your back. That's why I'm looking right through there. I'd rather scroll through your life than examine my own. But I have to tell you something. As good as we make our lives look, Jesus isn't fangirling over our Insta. He's not. He is way more interested in coming alongside you with the shovel and say, let's dig together, daughter. I know what's there, but not until you know what's there can the work actually be done. So I need you to take that thing, whatever that thing is that's distracting you, and move it over. Listen, the scroll will kill the soul. The scroll will kill the soul. You know how it happens? You scroll, and all of a sudden, comparison, robs us of contentment. Jealousy takes away our joy. Depression moves over our delight. We become women who are so peeved and not women who are at peace. But if we will remain distracted, we will never learn about ourselves. And listen, when you begin to learn about yourselves, you discover who it is God made you to be and what he wants you to do. And you're never gonna find that while you are distracted. Here's the, here's the idea, distraction is the enemy of discipline. We need more women. We need more women who will say, I am choosing to be a woman of discipline because I want to do the work, I want to do the digging that God is calling me to do. Which means whatever you're doing, that's awesome for you. I'm, I'm genuinely happy for you. I've got my own work to do. And we can talk about it and we can say it. But let me talk to the mothers and the aunts and the grandmothers in the room. Our daughters are watching. And if the gospel you preach isn't the gospel you live, they are not fools. We can't give them a Jesus and say, follow Jesus, but watch me. I'm busy over here following everybody else. They're watching. May they see in us be women of courage and women of truth. Listen to these verses from Proverbs 4, verses 23 through 27. And Proverbs is the book of wisdom. It's a father imparting wisdom to his son. So many verses start with this, listen to me. If you're a parent here, how many times have you said, you better listen to me? Why, because you've got wisdom. Whether they know it or not, whether they want it or not, you know and they don't. So what is Proverbs saying to us? Keep a vigilant watch over your heart. 
That's protective language. Another version says this, be careful how you think because your life is shaped by your thoughts. When I look at the condition of your life, I can see the condition of your thoughts. Don't talk out of both sides of your mouth. Avoid careless banter. Been on social media lately? Everybody's got an opinion and they wanna bless the world with it all the time. It says avoid careless banter, white lies and gossip. Keep your eyes straight ahead. Ignore all sideshow distractions. If distraction is what's keeping you from learning about yourself, then it doesn't take much to realize there's an enemy behind the distraction. He doesn't want you to become who God's called you to be. He doesn't want you to make a difference. He doesn't want to see you grow in character and wisdom and knowledge. He doesn't want to see you make a difference in the world. He doesn't want to see you raise world changers. So there's always going to be a sideshow distraction waiting to get your attention. But Proverbs says, keep a vigilant watch over your heart and watch your step and the road will stretch out smooth before you. Look neither to the right what she's doing or to the left, what she's doing. He says, leave evil in the dust. Man, I believe that in 2021 and heading into 2022, with everything that we've been through, with everything God's brought us through, he's calling daughters of courage. He's extending the invitation. He's saying, are you ready to do the work? Because I am. As I started doing this work on myself and discovering things that I didn't really like, I was left with a choice. Ignore it, put it aside, or face it head on. And have real conversations with real people who love me and want what's best for me. How do people experience you? Do you even know? Are they afraid to tell you? Are you afraid to hear? Listen, let me tell you, it is a valuable, worthwhile journey, one you will never regret even when it hurts. Have the courage to ask that question. What am I learning about myself? The second question is this, what are you learning about God? What are you learning about God? Who is God to you? And do you know the real God? Not long ago, I was talking to a friend about camping and this will shock all of you, I don't camp. Um, I'm always trying to figure out why if it's so great outside, why are the bugs always trying to come in? (laughs) Like I just don't understand that whole little. Nothing against you if you like to camp, I'm sure it's great. I just prefer a bed inside with air conditioning and a potty and all that kind of stuff. A potty that flushes, that I don't have to flush. Like I, I, just, I just prefer maybe glamping. I've heard glamping is a thing, maybe I could try that. But in a really bad storm, this friend talked about how the tent that they had had these tent poles that were so much wider and sturdier than the rest of their group. And so when a storm came, and I was like, another reason why I don't camp because a storm came and you were in a tent. Um, But when the storm came, what everybody did, they came into her tent. Why? Because her tent wasn't going anywhere. Because her tent poles were solid and sturdy and everyone found shelter under her tent. What you believe about God represents the tent poles of your life. Because we are all sitting here knowing the storm came. The storm is coming. So who is God? And what do you believe about God? And is what you believe about God going to hold you up in the storm? What are you learning about God? Here's what I've learned. If you don't know God in the good times, you won't trust him in the bad times. If you don't know him in the good times, you won't trust him in the bad times. A few weeks ago, we we do in our house, it's called birthday week. So my funny story about the bathroom was the night we celebrated Adam as a family. And then later, he and I went out for a beautiful day just to celebrate him without the kids. And everybody in here with kids said, amen, right? Yes, right. 
And so we, we went out and we decided to go down to the beach and we made reservations at this restaurant that overlooked the water. And because I'm an eight and not afraid to tell people what I want, I made the reservation, said it's my husband's birthday, so I would really like a beautiful spot like right by the water. And they were awesome, they did it. And when we sat down at our table, I, I want you to see the view. Do we have a photo of the view? Hopefully, maybe, maybe not. Someone say no or go. I mean, I could describe it for you, but it won't, it won't be too good, if they find it. it. The view was spectacular. Sunshine, blue skies, the whole thing. It was amazing. And I just sat there and I was like, look at this. Look at this view, feel this weather. I'm an East Coast transplant. It's November, I'm in short sleeves. We're outside, the Lord is good. God, you are so good to me. I was having the whole experience right there at the table. <laughs> 10 minutes later, we watched the fog roll in. It got so foggy, no lie, the, the, I don't even think the birds could see because the bird pooped on our table. <laughs> now, if that bird would have pooped in my drink, I would have been on the news for murder, murder an animal. <laughs> and I went from feeling so joyful and excited and happy and content and in love with my life to can you hurry up and finish that so we can get in your car and put the heat on because this humidity in my hair and everything is, and it just changed just like that. And looking back, I'm like, isn't that what we do though with God? When it's good, God, you're so good, it's so good, my hands are raised, my Bible is open, all the things, and then when it goes bad, hey, I want out, this isn't what I signed up for, I don't know where you are, I don't know why I even go to church, I don't even know why I sing the songs, because all of a sudden, everything's foggy and cloudy and dark, and now I don't believe anymore. And I would say we have to examine the condition of our tent poles. What's beautiful is that when Jesus was on earth, there's a story in Mark 4 where he is with the disciples. And I'm sure you've heard this story, but there are some incredible insights for you and me tonight in Mark 4, 35 through 41. It says that same day after it grew dark, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross over to the other side of the lake. And so leaving the crowd behind, the disciples got into the boat in which Jesus was already sitting and they took him with them, and other boats sailed with them. And suddenly, as they were crossing the lake, a ferocious storm arose with violent winds and waves that were crashing into the boat until it was nearly swamped. But Jesus was calmly sleeping in the stern, resting on a cushion. Other translations say with his head on a pillow. This, this, Jesus wasn't sleeping like, like you sleep when you're on a long road trip in your car with your head up and you're just back and forth and your mouth is open and you're, you're kind of sleeping but you're not sleeping. Jesus is out. Jesus is ambient out. He's out in the boat sleeping. And, and, and this storm is taking over. And these are experienced fishermen. They've been in storms before but this one was so bad that they went and they shook him awake saying, Teacher, don't you even care that we're all about to die? How many times have you prayed, Jesus, don't you even care? Jesus, don't you see? Jesus, I've prayed. Jesus, I've begged. Jesus, I've asked. Jesus, don't you care? From their perspective, from their knowledge, from what they knew and what they were experiencing, it was the end. Jesus, do something. Fully awake, he rebuked the storm and shouted to the sea, hush. Man, there's some of you in this room that right about now would be a perfect time for Jesus to say hush to whatever's going on in your life. He says, be still. And all at once, the wind stopped howling and the water became perfectly calm. Then he turned to his disciples and he said to them, why are you so afraid? Listen to this question. Haven't you learned to trust yet? But they were overwhelmed with fear and awe and said to another, who is this man who has such authority that even the wind and waves obey him? This is why studying your Bible is so important. The disciples hadn't just started following Jesus. 
At this point in their relationship with Jesus, they had seen him heal a leper. They had seen him turn water into wine. They'd seen him raise a boy from the dead. They'd seen him take a paralyzed man, pick up, stand up, walk, and take his mat. They had seen Jesus do incredible things, and they stood back and they cheered and they applauded and they said, isn't God good? Look what he did for them. But everything changed when it was their own storm. Everything changed when they were the ones who were about to die. And there are times where you and I are the same way. We look at what someone, what God does for someone else and we go, yes, I believe in that God. He's so good. I see what he's done for you. We're gonna praise him. We're gonna believe him in this storm. And then your storm comes and all of a sudden you don't know. And Jesus is asking, haven't you learned to trust yet? They were now in need of a miracle. They now needed to see that Jesus was who he said he was. And here's what they said about him. They said, even the wind and waves obey him. Tell me about your wind and waves tonight. What feels like it's gonna take you out? What prayer have you prayed and prayed and prayed till your knees give out? What's the hang up or the habit or the relationship or the situation that you are looking at God and you're saying, don't you care? That Jesus tonight is looking at you and he's saying, why are you afraid? Haven't you learned to trust yet? Even the wind and waves obey me. Even COVID obeys him. Even governments and government leaders submit to him. Every bout of depression and anxiety bows to him. Your broken relationship isn't beyond repair because it's not out of his control. You say, well, my storm's not over. And I'm saying to you, but Jesus is still in the boat. Your storm may not be over. But Jesus is still in the boat. And he wants you to trust him. Because he's good. And listen to me, sweet sister. He naps in the storm that gives you knots. He naps. He gets drowsy. He's got it. He's got it under control. But as I read the story this week, I saw something I had never seen before. In verse 36b, here's what it says. It says, other boats sailed with him. I'd never seen that before. Imagine what it was like for them. They didn't have anybody to wake up. They're in their boat and they're thinking, this is it for us, peace Jesus. I mean, I I can sort of see you over there, but I guess we're done. I guess it's over for us. They were near him, but proximity wasn't enough. And there are times, you guys, whereas I just observe the state of Christianity across our country, and I see the things that are said and done, I wonder, are there women that are just near Jesus, but you don't know Jesus? You come to the thing, you sing the songs and you wear the shirts and we want you to. We're glad you're here. Maybe you pick up the Bible or a devotional every now and then. Maybe you serve, maybe you give, maybe you're in a group. All of those things are awesome things that we want for you. But you're, it's not enough just to be near him. It's about knowing him. Because when you know him, then you will trust him. There's proximity, and then there's a personal relationship. 
And Jesus is inviting every single one of you in this room into a deeper relationship with him where you can know him. As I started doing this work on myself the past couple of years, what I had to confront was what I call cycles of perpetual anxiety. There were moments where it would become so much for me that I had a hard time swallowing my food. I would be filled with angst. And whenever that thing was that sort of moved out of the way, another thing came right behind it. It was just a perpetual cycle of anxiety. And I felt so afraid and I felt so defeated, but I don't like feeling afraid and I don't like feeling defeated. So what came out to other people was anger, but I wasn't angry, I was afraid. For some of you, what are you putting out there to cover up what's really going on inside? But let me tell you what this journey has done for me. As I began to dig and Jesus giving me the strength and the courage to dig and digging alongside of me, here's what I can stand before you tonight and say with total confidence. Jesus is gentle. And I can tell you this because I know him. Jesus is faithful. And I can tell you this because I know him. Jesus is patient. And I can tell you this because I know him. Jesus is willing and eager to meet with me whenever I choose to give him time. And I can tell you this because I know him. And my question for you tonight is do you know him? Or are you just content being near him? And maybe for some of you, you're content to be near him because your storm hasn't come. But listen to me, Jesus made us a promise. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. He didn't say you might. He didn't say in case. He said, you will. But he says, but take heart, be courageous, because I've overcome the world. And you will believe that Jesus is an overcomer if you know him. So I'm inviting you tonight, wherever you're at in your relationship with God, wherever your journey with Jesus is, tonight the invitation is to go deeper. Tonight, the invitation is to know him more. You say, where do I start? I would say you start in the Gospels. Pick a version like the message and start reading a chapter a day and get to know Jesus, the lover of your souls. Get in the boat with Jesus. And it's a decision you'll never regret. Women who are committed to learning about themselves and women who are committed to learning about, God's can be, about God can be women that change the world because we're authentic and we're fearless and we're brave and we know whose we are. But tonight there's a third question that I wanna ask you because what we've just been through together over the past several months has taken a lot out of us. Every struggle has been different. Every story has been different. There's been so much grief, so much loss, so much pain. So my third question for you tonight is this, what are you carrying? What did you come in here tonight carrying? Not too long ago, I ran into the grocery store on my way home from work and I only needed to get three things. I needed to get milk, toothpaste, and napkins. Yeah, I know that's random. They didn't all go together, you guys. It just was, we were out of all three. So I ran into the store and I said to my family, I'm getting milk, toothpaste, and napkins, and that's it. And I've got two hands and three things and I'm an eight, so I will make sure that I can make that work. Amen. And so I grabbed my three things and the text, well, we're out of cereal. Wait, are we out of all cereal? No, we're out of my favorite cereal. Okay. And before you know it, I was grabbing all the things. And now I look like an idiot walking through Ralph's, trying to hold everything. And a guy who works there, he kind of just walks by me and he does this. 
do you need a cart? <laughs> like his face was kind, but behind his eyes, he was like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> He's like, because we have things that were made to carry everything that you're holding. It's really nifty. So I went and I got a cart and put my stuff in. And I felt silly in the store. But later that day, I started thinking about all the things that we carry. And I wonder, not with, not with a look of disgust or disdain or anger or frustration, but I wonder if with a genuine look of kindness and love, Jesus is looking at you tonight and he's saying, I have something made to carry that for you. It's me. Because regardless of what you're holding, regardless of what you're carrying, regardless of what's weighing you down, Jesus, it's not too much for him. But when you think about this past year, this past couple of years, and everything that you've been through, I wonder what's sitting on you tonight that you just feel like you can't let go of. And I wonder if tonight the invitation from Jesus to you is to just lay that down. Like, what, why are you holding it when he does such a better job? Maybe for some of you it's sadness. Maybe you've known sadness these past two years more than you ever thought you would know it before and it just weighs so heavy on you. Maybe that's what you're carrying. Jesus is inviting you tonight. I read a statistic yesterday that said there's never been, it's almost like this is becoming its own sort of pandemic, an epidemic of anxiety. I shared some of my own story. When the world is chaotic, we feel so anxious. And you're carrying this tonight. There's a situation in your life that you just can't release. You're so anxious about it. And you brought it in and you're carrying it with you tonight. Maybe for some of you it's grief. Just grief over loss. There's someone that you won't celebrate with in a few weeks. Something's been taken from you. There's been a loss of a loved one. There's been a loss of a relationship. There's been a loss of a job and you just feel overwhelming grief. Maybe that is what you're carrying. Maybe some of you are just still carrying doubt. Yeah, Melody, Jesus, the storm, the boat, I get it. I just can't, I can't lay this down. I just feel cynical about the whole thing because look at the state of the world. Look at what's going on. How could I believe? Maybe you're weighed down with doubt. Women, this is our thing. Girls, this is our thing. Insecurity. Someone's better looking, someone's smarter, someone's wiser, someone's thinner, someone's richer, and you'll never be enough. And you just can't let this go. It's just a part of who you are by now. You've just learned to deal with it. You've learned with those nagging questions and lies, and it's just something that you're holding on to. Man, we struggle with this one, don't we? I don't know how to stop being jealous of her. I don't know how to stop being jealous of them. I don't know why I couldn't have that or why God didn't give that to me or make me that way. I don't know why their loss wasn't as deep or hard as mine. I don't know why I feel like I always come up short, but man, she's, she always has it. And you just don't know how to let this go. Maybe you're sitting in this room tonight and this is, there's nothing you feel like you can do. You've done everything you know to do and he's still left. You've done everything you know to do and that child's not coming back home. 
You've done everything you've known to do and that friendship is over. And your heart is just weighed down by the weight of this broken relationship. And you just don't know how to put it down. And there are so many of us who say we know Jesus and we love Jesus and we're walking around like this. Let me tell you guys how good Jesus is. Come listen to me. Come listen. Jesus takes care. Jesus will meet all your needs. And Jesus is looking at you tonight and he's saying, you don't have to do that. This is what he says in 1 Peter 5, 7. Listen to these words. He wants you to take all your stress and all your fear, and look at those words. He says, pour out all your worries. Pour them out. You say they're heavy, Jesus. I've been carrying this with me for years, Jesus. He's saying, let it go. Pour it out. Lay it here, it's not too heavy for me. I calm the storm, I calm the waves. I've healed, I'm the resurrected king. Look at everything I've done. You can lay all of your junk here. And then it says this, and leave it there. <laughs> leave it there. Listen, I don't know what you came in here carrying tonight, but I know you're carrying something. Jesus cares about what you're carrying. He so tenderly cares for you. And so right now, I'm inviting you into a time of healing. I want you to take whatever that is on you. Maybe it's not something I mentioned, maybe it's something else. Maybe it's something you've never told anybody. Maybe it's something your group's been praying about with you for years. But I want you to take whatever it is and as Becca sings this next song, I want you to just be with Jesus. I want you to listen to her sing these words, no one's ever cared for me like Jesus. And I want you to take those things and I want you to leave them there. You might wanna kneel. You might wanna grab the hand of the friend that came with you. You might just wanna sit before God, but listen, what are you carrying? If you're tired and you're heavy laden, he says, come to me and I will give you rest. So take these few moments with God and whatever it is, whatever it is you're carrying, leave it with him and leave it there. His faithful hand has held me on this way. When I'm old and gray, all my days are numbered on the earth. Let it be in you alone. My joy was found.
never cared for me like Jesus. His faithful hands held me all this way. When I'm old and great, all my days are numbered only when let it be in you When I'm old and gray, all my days are numbered only when let it be known in you alone. My joy was found. There's joy for you tonight. There's joy for you in the midst of sadness and there's joy in the midst of sorrow. Because this world is not our home. We're not gonna get everything we want here. But Jesus is gonna give us more than we could even imagine when we get to our final home. So tonight, maybe you just hear the voice of Jesus saying to you, hang on, the storm's not over, but I'm still in the boat. And I can take whatever it is you're carrying and I can hold it for you. I can carry it for you. I want you to put it down. I want you to lay it down and I want you to leave it there. And as silly as I looked in the grocery store, walking around, could you imagine if I was, uh, if I was like made that store's commercial? How silly that would look? Hey, come to Ralph's where you have to carry all your own stuff. You're not going there. But sometimes as followers of Jesus, I wonder if we look silly to the world because we're carrying all of our stuff and we're saying, no, Jesus is awesome. Jesus is the best. 
Jesus wants you to lay your stuff down because he has laid out a wardrobe for you to put on. Here's how Colossians 3 describes it. It says, you are always and dearly loved by God. Hear that tonight. You are so dearly loved by God. He says, so robe yourselves with virtues of God. Dress in the wardrobe God picked out for you. God has picked out a wardrobe for you and he does a better job than the rack. He paid for it, that's why. He's laid out a wardrobe for you since you have been divinely chosen to be holy. Listen to the wardrobe. Be merciful as you endeavor to understand others. Be compassionate, showing kindness toward all. Be gentle and humble, unoffendable in your patience with others. Tolerate the weaknesses of those in the family of faith, forgiving one another in the same way you've been graciously forgiven by Jesus Christ. If you find fault with someone, release the same gift of forgiveness to them. For love is supreme and must flow through each of these virtues. Listen, because love, love becomes the mark of true maturity. Don't tell me how long you've known him. Don't tell me how many years you've been a Christian. Don't tell me all the mission trips that you've been on. Don't tell me all the K-Love concerts you've been to. Show me your love. Because that's the true mark of maturity. Could someone look at your Instagram, your Facebook, the things that you post about, the things that you fight about and say, man, I see that love. I see that true mark of maturity in her life. Why? Because kindness is not about being nice. This idea of living kindly is because God's laid out a wardrobe and he's inviting all of us tonight to put it on. Because when we leave this outside these walls, as never before in my lifetime have I seen a world so broken and desperate and in need of someone to tell them that Jesus loves them. And if it's not you, then who? If it's not gonna be you, then who? Living kindly means living like Jesus. Putting on kindness means putting on Christ. And that's what Cultivate is all about. It has always been about. It's about being like Jesus, being known for love and being known by our kindness. And throughout the years, we've done a lot of different things to show our love and to show kindness to those in need. Over the past five years, cultivate you, so many of you, together as we've come together and given back from what God's given us. We've given over $30,000 to women in need, to women on the mission field, to families in health crisis, to widows, to those who serve in our military. We've done baby showers and kindness offerings. We've done all kinds of things, why? Because we want the world to see that this kindness thing isn't just an act or a thing that we say or a thing that we put on our t-shirts, but it's who we are and it's how we live. And so tonight I, I wanna invite you to be a part of a kindness offering for one of our own. There's been so much grief and so much loss these past few years and just a few months ago, a young family in our church experienced the grief like they'd never known before. A young couple, Dakota and Jenny Haggard, were on their way home. Just a couple of blocks from their house were in a car accident and it took Dakota's life. He had just become a dad. They just started a community group started his own business, so excited about everything that lies ahead for them. Because this world is broken. Way earlier than anybody here wanted him to, Dakota met Jesus face to face. But he's 
still here is this beautiful wife, Jenny, who, who came to Sandals through Cultivate. And I know for some of you, that's your story as well. And they have a sweet baby, cute, precious little baby, Hayes, that she's raising on her own. And tonight, you and I have the opportunity to do exactly what Colossians 3 says for the family of faith to show that love is the true mark of our maturity, to give, to show that this kindness isn't just a tag, but it's our character, it's who we are. And so we're gonna receive an offering and the majority of this offering is going straight to her for her and for her family. And what we want her to know tonight is that she is so dearly loved by God in the midst of the greatest storm she's ever faced. And you and I tonight, we get to be the hands and feet of Jesus to her and her precious little boy. So as the worship team comes back on to lead us and sing, and we worship God with our voices, we can also worship him with our gifts. You'll see some of our Cultivate team across the front that you can just come forward and give, and you can also do it at give.se. But however you choose to give to be a part of this kindness offering, we say thank you. Because this is Jesus in you and Jesus for them. So I'm going to invite you to stand while we worship.
all my life. tonight, Matt was like, are you so nervous? I said, well, I'm not nervous because we have it set. 
Everything is done. Everything is ready. But this doesn't happen if no one comes. And you guys came tonight in such weird and crazy times. You're here, and it just means so much to us because me and my team, we just love you guys so much. And this vision that we have to follow Jesus and to be women who live kindly because we believe that, it's nothing without you guys. So we're just so grateful that you trust us to lead you in this way and that you show up every time we do something. And honest to God, you guys are the best women ever that get to lead and live life with. So we're so grateful. I just want to thank Melody tonight for... Um, for speaking that message. And Melody spoke tonight for me because I was set to do this, but she happens to know a little bit about what I've been carrying and took this for me. So Mel, thank you so much. So good. She also knows I never cry. <laughs> you guys, the things that Melody said about tonight, about, you know, you might be near to Jesus, but you don't know him. And what are you carrying? See, the thing I know is just tonight, I've talked with some of you who've, who've lost your spouse, who's lost your job, who's lost your best friend, who just got a bad diagnosis, whose kids aren't doing well, who's lost a baby. I know some of the things that you guys are carrying that none of you have no idea about. So when we ask you to come here and live kindly to the women around you, it's because you don't know what each other's carrying, but I know. I know a lot of what you're carrying, and when we live kindly towards one another, it really makes all the difference. You guys, we put these cards on your seats, and it's 21 ways of living kindly when you leave here. This is baby steps, you guys. This is like child's play for kindness. But we're gonna ask you guys to commit that from now until Christmas Eve, every single day, you make a priority to live kindly to someone. I would say look for the person, the person at your work, the person in your family, the person in the lobby right now that looks alone because you have no idea what a kind word from you, what an invite tonight probably meant to some of you guys, what an invite over, paying for coffee, Say, babysitting a young person's kid. If you have young kids and during this holiday season and someone offers, like, let me watch that and go, go just have a day. You don't know what that means in that season for them. You guys know people. You see them, reach out, do it. You, it will not return void. Even if you never know the difference that you make in your own heart, it never returns void. So we're going to ask you to take this. And the, the most important one on here is the very center. And it says, invite someone to our Christmas Eve service. Because your invite might be the thing that gets them here. And when they get here, they might meet Jesus for the very first time. And we don't know our days. They are numbered. We talked to you about our sweet friend tonight. And her and I got to talk tonight, and I said, you know what? This is awful, and it's terrible, but he was ready, and so are you, because you know Jesus, because you showed up here, and you made that time, because they were invited. You don't know what your act of kindness to invite someone to church ever, but I'm just pointing out Christmas Eve, the difference we could make, because we don't know what storms are coming, but we know with Jesus that we're gonna be okay. So we ask you guys to do that tonight, to invite someone. I want to make sure I'm doing all these things I'm supposed to do. Last thing. Some of you guys, like Melody said, you live kind of near Jesus, and you think proximity is enough, but you don't know him. And if that's you tonight, if you've never known Jesus for yourself, and you wanna do that, I'm gonna ask if you're a licensed minister here tonight or one of our pastor's wives, if you can come up after. And if this is you, if you're tired of being near but you wanna know, if you come forward, we will pray with you. We will walk that with you, we'll get to know you so that you too can not just be near him but that you can know him. And like I said, when you leave here tonight, this isn't just an event that we come to that we try to make look pretty and have fun things. 
it's because we want you to know Jesus. And people will know him when they see that you know him. So when we leave tonight, let all of us go and live kindly. Thanks so much for coming tonight, you guys. I love you dearly.